I titled my speech Narrating Development, the use of uh, narrative to study sociocultural embedded human development. Um, and what I decided to do first, just because while preparing this, as I said, I was very aware of myself being a developmental psychologist. Um, so what I decided to do first is um, unpack um, how I understand and how I use as a psychologist in my work, how I use language and narrative. Um, because at least in the field of psychology, um, there's still large, you know, great division between what the mainstream psychology is still about um, and what the kind of more, uh, kind of, well, let's call them alternative versions of psychology are about and how they look human mind um, and um, uh, consequently also how they look at the role, um, the role of language. So, I'm sorry, it's something I thought would work, doesn't work, all right. So, I use an approach to narrating that is based in a sociocultural premise of the interdependence of the individual with the social, material, and historical, and the emphasis on people's sense-making processes and capacities. Um, and as all approaches join from sociocultural frameworks, I intentionally use the plural because, right, there's no one, um, one right kind of a singular sociocultural approach uh, framework. Um, this kind of dynamic narrating that I will talk about today is in its essence dialectical, as it studies phenomena in movement historically and relationally as they develop. Um, and for that reason, this approach places great importance on designing research studies that allows um, development in co of complex and sometimes even contradictory meanings um, in context, as, as I named them here. So my research illustrates approach to language as constitutive, interpretive, and transformative, rather than referential, instrumental, um, and transactional. Um, and the way that um, dynamic narrating is different from some other narrative approaches, right, kind of the approach that I'm using in, in my work, is that it regards narrating primarily as the process of interpretation. Um, and not um, reproduction or representation of our experiences and actual life events, right? So, so, so what's not in my interest is um, how truthful, right? The veracity of the stories is kind of not something that is in my interest, which is um, in the focus of, of, of many psychologists, right? Kind of life history approach, um, where it's actually about, right? Kind of ver the veracity, truthfulness of the stories that we tell. And the discursive approach I take is primarily concerned with how people use narrating to interpret the world around them and they place in it. Um, um, and uh, how the sense we make about the world around us, how it incorporates our social context. So all my research projects were designed following the principles that narrating is a dynamic relational activity, that people use narrating to interact with others actually present or implied, envisioned, right? Um, their environments themselves in diverse ways. Um, and in order to account for this um, lifelike diversity, if you will, in narrating, all my research um, involves, kind of tries to invite participants in multiple narrating um, activities, employing multiple uh, narrative genres created for different purposes and directed towards different audiences. So, so in a way, and actually I also do that in my teaching, in the way I teach writing, both in psychology and for my grad students where I teach academic writing and social sciences is I develop even assignments in my teaching that always try to play with the rhetorical context, right? Who is telling, how is that person telling, what is the genre, with which purpose for, for which audience? So I also try to play with the rhetorical context in, um, in, my, in my research. Um, and diverse narrative designs thus allow kind of diverse kind of these diverse um, the activities uh, what they're doing with these multiple narrating practices, as they call them here, um, they allow the insights into multiple perspectives, right, that people may take on one and the same issue. Um, so, so when we think about, so while narrating from one perspective and for one particular audience, certain issues may be minimized or even silenced, right, due to, for example, power dynamics. It really depends who we're addressing. Uh, but these same issues may be spoken up and put forth while taking another person's, um, another standpoint, right? Or directing our 
a speech or a writing towards towards someone else. Um, so um, since since the issues that participants mention in their narratives are likely determined by the present or implied readers and listeners of the narrative, um, as coined by Bakhtin, one of our my Fernanda's favorites, um, eliciting narratives from multiple stakeholders' perspectives gives sound to voices that would otherwise remain silent had we included only one stakeholder stance, um, for example. So, so when you think about so storytelling is dynamic and relational, right? So that's the stance I'm addressing. And in order to grasp what a narrator is doing with a story, we need to take into account the narrator audience issue meaning system. So here, some of you may notice that I'm kind of using the template coming from the uh, activity theory, right? Um, that this is what should be taken into account to really kind of understand kind of who is telling the story to whom, about what, and for what purpose. Um, and by designing multiple expressive activities and asking participants to provide more than one narrative and by engaging them in multiple relational stances, we open possibilities um, by inviting complexity and contradiction in people's narratives, right? So in the, in this contradiction is something that I'm very much interested in, right? So as a psychologist and also like I say narrative psychologist, uh, psychology tends to overemphasize and overvalue uh, coherence, right? Um, that healthy life is about having a coherent um, story. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I think coherence is overrated, right? So I think that we can get um, into very interesting aspects of our kind of functioning and sense making when we, when we invite contradiction. So to summarize in a way, um, yeah, this is a presumptuous statement, right? Language is a social fact. Um, so language and narrative so inherently social that we can say that and because uh, we cannot make full sense of them without the regard and understanding of the social context in which they are practiced. So meaning is constructed through interaction with actual or implicit others in relation to social structures, power relations, and one's own, uh, one's own needs and goals. Um, so we can say the narratives are social products in function of the audience, and as I said previously, genre, purpose. Um, and now to add, in function also of social histories and social memberships of people who create them. Um, so I look at kind of both language and narrative as cultural tools that embody social activities that people, um, that social activities and that provide also a mechanism for analyzing relationships between um, individual and sociocultural context. So I really see it as this point of like an intersection, right? For me, I see kind of narrative as a meeting point of individual and social, a kind of a tool that helps us understand um, how what's out there gets in here in a way. Uh, if we are really, if we really have to think about humans as, right, human mind is being um, located, right, situated in, in our head. Um, so, so now to be more specific about the work that I do, uh, my research agenda concerns particularities of growing up in the contemporary urban settings. settings. And um, one thing that characterizes lives of youth growing up in the metropolitan context is that they cross multiple boundaries of race, class, culture, and neighborhood daily. Um, so what I want to start kind of exploring almost a decade ago when I um, started with my doctoral studies here um, is exploring how these contrasting right kind of worlds in which young people specifically in New York City live how it shapes their sense making about the world around them um, and in one of my past projects that I will focus heavily on today kind of I looked at how young people from different diverse and contrasting backgrounds um, around New York City how they make sense about injustice um, and again back to so I use narrative as a tool of looking into young people's um, sense making so so again, I situated it all kind of, yeah, situated a bit. Um, so, 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 so as I said, kind of I focused on, on young people in New York City, which is considered as one of the kind of hyper diverse, right? Metropolis uh, characterized by hyper diversity, right? In terms of, so for example, young people are now a teacher at a public university um, and across all public um, education system, 47, around 47% of students speak language other than English. Uh, right at home. So, so we are talking about all possible, almost all possible forms of diversity um, that we're facing here. Linguistic, cultural, racial, socioeconomic, right? 
Uh, but unfortunately, very often when we talk about diversity, we also talk about disparity, right, and, and um, inequality. So, so you will see that's what inspired. So here, I will tell you a bit about the study, but I really try going beyond what this study was about, of course, that provides me the content, but my focus will be on the methodology and on, um, as Jesse said, kind of triangulation, uh, but more, more in terms of kind of how am I layer, kind of laying over different aspects, different types of analysis, right? And how do I paint a kind of whole picture um, using four different, um, at least here I'm presenting four different types of analysis that I do um, using the same data set. So just to provide enough of, of the context so I can talk about the methodology, uh, the purpose of the study was to explore how the lessons from contrasting socioeconomic backgrounds make sense um, about fairness, right? Um, and um, I wanted also to explore how their conception about fairness changes as they alternatively take perspectives of the self, object, and subject of injustice. So here you can kind of already start sensing um, how am I doing what I, you know, uh, what I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation when I said that I always try to engage participants in multiple narrating activities, right? Um, again, so, so, so here is how I played with a rhetorical context um, in this study. So I had young people write um, a story created for the purpose of this study that was also pilot, piloted on a different um, sample of 60 young people um, um, yeah, a year prior to this study. So I had them read a story that was that depicted um, a kind of a big use social situation where, uh, where um, uh, an instance of exclusion happened, most likely, right? Something unfair happened. So I had them retell that story four times. Uh, first time they were told, and this is where I named here as personal perspective, right? That was the personal story. I simply asked them to tell about experience, something that happened to them or to someone they know, right? Just, you know, it happened to a friend just to provide a buffer when people don't feel comfortable talking about their own experiences. Um, and I will say more about that as well. There's something interesting going on there, right? When it comes to personal autobiographic accounts versus uh, these other fictional hypothetical accounts. Um, then they were told the story from the perspective of the culprit, very plausible culprit in the story, perspective of the victim. These were counterbalanced for the kind of methodology nerds. Um, and um, and the, the final perspective was kind of also victim, uh, but um, here it wasn't left up to a participant to decide, right, kind of what happened. They, they were given explicit interpretation saying that imagine that you are, right, that character that got excluded and that you feel that what happened to you wasn't fair. So that's what I named the complaint letter, right? Um, these activities, emails were directed towards their peers, friends, um, and the complaint letter was directed at a school official of their choosing. And the personal story, personal story had an implicit audience, right? So um, nothing was specified there. So they either thought of me as their audience or uh, someone, um, someone simply implicit um, in their mind. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly, so, so you get an idea. So, um, so this was a comparative study and what I had to compare were stories for different uh, narrative activities. Um, and for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just focusing on two contrasting groups, um, teens that came from what I call lower and higher SES. Here, I'm just making a small note on this because that's subject of all another discussion. And in one of the papers I mentioned that I got published, I was about to actually get published in language and communication. I talk more about this problem of disambiguating race and class, especially, right, kind of in New York context and in many other contexts, right? So, um, so in a way, so talking about like socioeconomic status is, that was an organizing variable, but uh, the way I use it, it's a composite variable um, comprised of like eight other variables, right? So in a way, maybe a better term to use is privilege, right? Because I looked at students, uh, kind of teenagers, uh, racial, ethnic background, immigration status, their parents' immigration status, parents' level of education, uh, profession, languages spoken at home, high school they go to, zip code where I live, right? Kind of multiple. So that's what I mean by the composite. So this is just in the lack of a better term um, that I'm saying lower and higher SES, um, acknowledging that, of course, there are systemic um, racial differences going on um, in New York City and elsewhere 
um, in, in the US. And we know that people of color are more likely, right, proportionately, um, kind of are more likely to live below, kind of to live in, low, in poverty, below the poverty line. Um, so I ended up with 160 um, narratives in total. So the narrative analysis I, um, I used, um, some of the analysis I used in this work and, and in other research studies, um, and prior to this one, so some of these have been kind of well, well tested. You know, of course, there's still so much work to do, but um, it helps me make some sense out of my participants' experiences. And you're also kind of there to um, look at it and scrutinize it, right, and, and um, provide kind of alternative explanations. Um, so first, first type of analysis that I'm, I'm doing is um, psychological state expression analysis. Um, so those of you familiar to Jerome Bruner's work, if you remember, he talked about how each story is portraying the landscape of action and la landscape of consciousness. So when we think about the landscape of action of a story, that's, that entails kind of how we set up a story, that entails kind of the characters. Um, um, and while the landscape of consciousness includes the, the psychological language used in a story, that infuses characters with psychological life, right? So in a way, and I think Bruner called it kind of magnet for empathy. So this is what we're doing in our narrating when we use this language, we help the reader empathize with, with the characters. So, so now you can always start thinking about what is this doing to our writing and our speech and what is this doing to the listening and reading of someone else's um, narration, right? So, so, I, so I'm using, I'm using this analysis um, whenever I can. So this is just to provide an illustration. Um, I usually I do all this coding in the qualitative data analysis software um, and Vivo most recently. Um, so this is not exactly how it looks like in Vivo, but um, um, yeah, this is for the sake of being able to present it here. So here you can see that I highlighted with blue cognitive expression, like found out and lie and know find out, right, some other more, more common are like thinking, right, realizing, etc. So these are cognitive expressions. And I highlighted with red affective expressions, needed, want, want, haha, right, um, happy, mad, right. So these are the expressions that um, refer to, um, to feelings. Um, another type of analysis that I'm doing that is very meticulous. I have to admit, I'm not, I, I've done it only once. That's because it's just so labor intensive. Um, and I'm just saying it to future researchers, not to discourage, but kind of not, maybe to discourage you, um, not to kind of praise myself for spending months doing this. But it's very meticulous uh, running the analysis that it's called character mapping, uh, which entails kind of, which helps us see how all authors focalize their use of psychological state expressions and actions on each character. Um, instead uh, on, on one character instead of the other. So, so what we're doing, we're coding for each character, like first person, singular, second person, and then we affiliate all specific characters in the story with psychological state expressions that go with that character and actions. So in a way, what this analysis, and I'll show you here, this is how this same narrative is coded once we do character mapping. So here we see we, so the character is we, and found out is highlighted in red because that's first person plural. This is the pronoun. This is the psychological state, uh, state accompanying it. Um, so I have now a hard time because I see little videos here in the corner. Let me minimize uh, Fernanda and myself and Tony. Uh, so I can see. So here we have second person, uh, you, you, you snore, you, you, right? So in a way, what this analysis is helps, us, help, helps us do, we're kind of seeing how much is the author uh, infusing different characters, how much is the author giving, how much agency is the author giving to different characters in their story, right? Because if you attribute a character with a lot of psychological state expressions and action, that character is very lively, right? That character is very much brought to life, life right? Um, so, so, so I'll show you kind of what, what this analysis can, um, can show us um, in a few moments. Then another analysis that um, I'm doing in my research is plot analysis, right? This directly comes from kind of literary uh, tradition. So um, there are multiple plot elements. Not all narratives have all plot elements, right? From initiating action, culmination, right? Uh, climax, uh, resolution, turning point before that. 
Um, so, so I looked at several uh, plot elements um, in each of the stories. Um, and here I just focus on one plot element, which is the trouble, as I call it, right? It's actually, Bruner called it trouble. It's kind of what is, the, what is the event that sets things in motion, right? So initiating action, is that this trouble is what makes the story worthy of telling, right? Something happens and that, that sets things in motion. So I analyze for that because if you remember, I'm asking young people to interpret a story that is about inclusion. So, and that is ambiguous. So I want to see how they read that story. Do they see it as an instance of unfairness, injustice, or do they read it as something, you know, something there was a misunderstanding and someone didn't have bad intentions, right? So I wanted to see what they see as the initiating action. Is, was someone being unfair? Did someone ex exclude someone else? Or did someone just did something accidentally that hurt someone else and excluded them from, uh, from a peer group? So this is why I focus on this aspect of the plot analysis. And then finally, I just gonna briefly talk about also the content analysis that I'm doing. I put the asterisks here because I don't see content, it's not narrative analysis, right? Content analysis, it's its, it's own thing. Uh, but sometimes it gets lumped with other uh, narrative analysis. So I simply looked at the expressions of fairness and there was an exhaustive list of expressions that I coded for um, in across, kind of across all narratives, right? So those were words such as unfair, unjust, fake, behind my back, right? Kind of lying, deceiving, you know, uh, being deceitful, um, unfair, and, and so on. So let me tell you what I got. So try being brief just for the sake of time so we leave um, time for questions. So um, what I find first, first analysis looked across four different narrative contexts. Um, and of course, what I, not of course, but what I found is that there was a systematically varied use of narrative strategies across four narrative activities, right? So now if I just look at the psychological state expressions, right? So, um, so we can see that, actually, let me tell you more. Um, let me show you one example, one illustration of the differences, um, and then I'll explain, I'll, I'll say more. So this is an example from the same author. This is the same uh, young person, Elizabeth, and the first narrative is what, the, what is what she wrote when she narrated from the culprit's perspective. And the other one she wrote when she narrated from the victim's perspective. And for example, one thing that we can notice here is that her, we see kind of way higher use of, first of all, in general, higher use of psychological state expressions in her narrative from the victim perspective. But what was higher is actually the use of cognitive expressions. So her language didn't become more emotional as she positioned as the victim, right? Um, but it came more cognitive, a lot of thought and guess, don't know, have to guess what, right, was interested, the decision was made, has been made, et cetera. So this just to give you one illustration of how it looks like, right? What, I mean, what do I mean by um, um, when I say that there were differences in the use of this particular narrative strategy across different narrative activities? So what could be said about that um, is that, um, this is how I can summarize. So if we just focus on, not the best choice of the word, autobiographical, let's say, but those personal stories really were personal. No one wrote about their friend or their cousin, right? So they, um, students wrote about their experiences of exclusion, actually. So that's why I named an autobiographical, even though um, I, at the beginning of the project, I, I didn't know that they would actually share their own stories necessarily. Um, so they didn't use the opportunity to talk because I said, just think about something that happened to you or to someone you know. So this was mostly about something that happened to them. Um, so what I found there is that autobiographical narratives written in response to the first narrative prompt um, uh, were the longest ones in this research study. Um, however, while these narratives were the longest um, and um, were kind of longer and more elaborate than other narrative activities in terms of providing the context, setting up the scenes, they really were more com complex. So, so what I'm saying this is they were more complex in terms of the uh, portraying the landscape of action, but they were, they were less interesting when it comes to, uh, they were kind of less saturated with psychological state expressions than, um, than uh, most of the other uh, most of the other um, writing genres in this study that, that were in a, in a way hypothetical, right? And fictional, um, if you will. Um, so 
as I said, so the authors focus more on depicting the landscape of action. So here I could say a bit more, but I'm just now pick and choosing, right? So I don't, um, so I can finish time and leave space for, for questions. Um, and then very briefly, uh, what could be said about um, other three fictional genres um, is that culprit narrative and personal story genres were least conducive to bestowing characters with mental life, right? Uh, while the two victim narratives, victim email and complaint letter genres were most laden with psychological language, right? So when we think about, so why, so victim narratives, victim email and complaint letter, so why they were most laden so well, um, it's, um, it's, it's because it's hard being positioned in this way, right? So it's hard narrating from the perspective of someone who got hurt, right? Um, and excluded by their peers. And also the teacher also might have been involved um, somehow. So maybe they were also wronged by the teacher as well. So, so whenever we're writing about something as troublesome as this, maybe it takes just um, more cognitive work, right? So in that sense, cognitive expressions, especially if we see this line here, right, kind of very high for a victim and complaint letter served as a sense-making aid, right? So this is hard for me. So I'm using the tools that kind of help me make sense of something actually hurtful um, that, that happened um, to me. Another set of findings that um, also draws from the psychological state analysis is that I observed a higher variation among participants from lower SES. And one of the papers I published was just on this line of analysis. It was kind of very interesting where I got there. I, mean, I find it interesting, hopefully you do too, um, is that here when we look at the variation in the use of this strategy, right? So this is the graph for teens from higher socioeconomic background. And as we can tell, so, so um, this looks rather different than what we got um, in the sample of, of teens from um, kind of lower socioeconomic backgrounds, right? So, so in a way, they just, they change their narrative strategies more as they took perspectives of different um, stakeholders, as they addressed um, different, different audiences. So what I found based on the character mapping, do you remember that nasty analysis I mentioned earlier um, that is so time consuming because you're dealing with 18 codes um, and there's so much manual clicking that you need to do. No automatic coding, right, can be done there. Um, is that less privileged youth focus more on non-I actors. Um, so I'll give you, I'll provide you one illustration. So here is this narrative, dear Sam, today in school. So we see, I use the red to code third first person plural uh, pronouns and affiliated uh, psychological state expressions and actions. So we see most of this narrative is about we, right? I'm kind of this kind of we that provides, serves also as a buffer instead of saying I. So, but that's for another story. Um, I wrote about it elsewhere. Um, and then we have um, highlighted with blue, right, kind of third, third person, kind of non-first non person characters. And then and here I picked these two just because they illustrate well the pattern that I found across two contrasting um, socioeconomic groups um, in my New York sample. And here we can see an example from a student from lower socioeconomic position. So we see the first person, is coded with purple, magenta. I talked, I talked. See, that's the, that's the magenta. But then we can see what's in blue is someone else. It's teacher, it's Alex, it's she, right? So there's much, it's, there's greater focus on other actors that are not the I or the we um, of the story. So in a way, um, how I interpreted this is that they really relate more closely to multiple, um, to multiple perspectives. And the next type of, um, and the results that I got um, based on the plot analysis, right? So here, and you will see why I highlighted less, less privileged youth more likely to see injustice, right? Just because the next thing I'll show you is about like less privileged youth being more likely uh, to call out injustice, right? It's about how you understand a story, but it's also about how you then write about it, right? How explicitly you talk about injustice. So, um, so what I will point, point your attention to is a um, couple of things. 
actually, let me just tell you first how I coded it. So what young people saw as the initiating actions in the vignette they read. So they first thought that the problem, the trouble was about desired and scarce resources, right? We wanted all two of us, three of us wanted to be in the same room, but only two of us could. So, you know, like we couldn't get it. Well, not everybody could get what they wanted. Exclusion, that's explicit. Someone did something to exclude someone else. Lying and deception, that's when they, right, and explicitly kind of saw and talked about lying and deception. Then there's something that I call unintentional exclusion. I'll tell you more about it um, shortly. And something that I call the private agency, but I will not focus on that. Just want to draw your attention to um, these numbers here that uh, youth from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, we're in a way more likely to see uh, exclusion and deception, right, in comparison to teens from higher SES. While teens from higher SES were more likely to see something that I called unintentional exclusion, meaning that, you know, like this happened, kind of unintentional exclusion means that the perpetrator did something wrong without actually taking responsibility for it, right, when you think about what these narratives look like. Um, and I will give you actually an illustration of that. Um, uh, just brief, I just focused on the unintentional exclusion. So the narrative says, um, in the first field trip, I arrived at school and tried to find my friends uh, so we can see who was going to sit next to me. By the time I got to school, all my friends um, had already found their partners to the bus drive, leaving me alone, right? So here it's kind of, you see, it just kind of happened that someone got excluded. It's not explicit as in this other narrative where, you know, like she was furious that she went behind her back, right? Here it's kind of clear that someone did something wrong. Um, so there's a difference in how these two teenagers saw what happened in the story. And lastly, this is the result of the content analysis. This is really tiny thing that I did just looking at the cognitive, uh, at the unfairness uh, expressions. Um, so and, and here, as I said, here I highlighted the words call out. So less privileged youth, more likely to call out injustice. So if, here, if we look at um, actually higher numbers, mean a greater frequency of these expressions because I use the word interval, meaning per how many words can we find a word that is an expression of unfairness, right? So um, higher, low, sorry, lower the numbers, higher the actual incidence of these words um, in kind of respective groups and in respective narrative activities. So here we can also see that teens from lower SES consistently show higher use of, um, at, of expressions of unfairness, which is the word like fair, unjust, deceitful, lying, fake, right, unfair, um, awfully wrong, um, and, and so on. So as long as it's kind of really explicit kind of uh, calling out of, of, of what happened there. So I'll have to skip kind of what, what I prepared here. So I just kind of want to summarize what I, um, so summarize what I kind of got kind of layering uh, these different lines of analysis. So first one is a higher socio, there's higher sociocognitive, as I call it, flexibility uh, among less privileged youth. So youth from lower SES showed greater variation across four narrative activities. They showed greater capacity to read, interpret, and embody perspectives of different actors. They showed to become just more skillful at relating to and performing as both the object and subject of injustice, right? Because when they were positioned as the culprit, they were also more likely to uh, call out, to say like, listen, dude, I did something off, you know, like I, you know, I worked behind his back, but you know, like I got us to room together at a school trip, etc. So even as the culprit, they owned it and they called it out, right? Um, they use the right language for what it did, right? Instead of using the buffers of, you know, this happened, I didn't know, you know, the outcome, um, et cetera. So they were just kind of more explicit um, in everything um, they were doing and showed greater flexibility in adjusting their experience, knowledge, and communicative style, kind of all in all. Um, then another kind of set of findings that are kind of little summary that I can make is that less privileged youth um, uh, call out injustice, kind of, right, more, more bluntly. So the lessons from low SES narrate more directly about injustice. They're more likely to see exclusion, lying, and deception as the main reasons for telling the story. I mean, I highlighted these words because these are the names of actual codes I used. Um, and they're also more likely to appropriate the roles of the perpetrator and victim of exclusion. 
right? So kind of scary to see the redundancy just because I, um, I thought a different lines of analysis were telling the same story. Um, and in a way, what I learned about the genres, right? Kind of looking at four different narrating activities. Um, so kind of really try theorizing of, uh, about genres as being de providing different degrees of mediation. So we think of genres as cultural tools, right? That provide mediation that is that free us from the immediacy of, of our own experiences. So in that sense, autobiographical um, and fictional genres provide different degrees of mediation, right? Um, so meaning that fictional stories provide greater buffer um, than autobiographical stories that make us the obvious, right, um, um, uh, protagonist of our story. And autobiographical story was used as an opportunity to recount happenings and focus on landscape of action. Um, while the fictional narratives allow the author to be less exposed and removed from their own experiences. It's kind of more conducive to consideration of various interpersonal and interpersonal, um, interpersonal, excuse me, and interpersonal dynamics. So in a way, um, at least for, for us psychologists, maybe you language and literally people would kind of, for you, this was more evident and yeah, we should kind of have more uh, of an interdisciplinary kind of yeah, interaction. Um, is that this, this can be counterintuitive that we actually invite people to talk about something personal that it could be actually more revealing about, about, about people's personal experiences, right? Um, so for me, as someone who works with young people, it's interesting thinking about how I can use fiction to actually engage young people to talk about the most personal and most sensitive topics um, that, that are relevant in their lives. Um, and this is just in the lack of a better illustration. So, I cannot exactly talk about, I mean, triangulation comes from a bit different tradition um, and it's not that I had different data points. So, so what I have here is um, how they call them. They call this, I think, um, overlaid photography, right? So here we have dozens of photographs overlaid, right? Kind of laid one over, over the other. So this is also how I see the work that I'm doing when I'm applying multiple narrative analysis um, um, using the same data set. So, while this image may be blurry, I find it much more interesting than, now I didn't share with you, than the original ones, right? That kind of constitute this overlaid uh, photograph here. I just kind of find the story that we can tell much richer, not just more artistic, just like this photograph, but kind of richer and in motion, right? So instead of kind of having a snapshot of a kind of single moment, we try to capture development in motion, right? Which was all that Vygotsky was about. Um, so, so yeah, this is for me as dynamic as a photograph can be, right? And as historical um, as, um, um, as we can imagine, at least as I can imagine it. Um, and yes, with this, I would end. And here's the contact information. Please write it down before um, I stop sharing my screen. Um, I welcome all your questions, uh, comments, uh, challenge, challenges, um, and so on.